happy to have uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Gwen Fields, to, uh, to give a talk on his uh, project. Uh, I'm sure you all heard of his uh, NISCAP project, but uh, you probably don't know much about uh, the details and uh, most importantly, the impact of this project. Well, now you have a chance to hear from the person who designed the project and who's doing the project today. Okay. So uh, let's give a warm welcome to uh, to uh, the Dr. Glenn Steele. And also, uh, don't forget to sign in if you are. Uh, you are, you, you are persistent enough to wait till the last moment to, uh, to be able to pitch on the we, uh, we need your singing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yeah, you guys hear me? I should have a microphone on and uh, for us in the room and for the camera. We really use the audio. I have it. So thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about EDUCE Lab and in general some work I've been doing in heritage science. Um, EDUCE Lab comes from the word EDUCE, which is actually an English word, and it means to bring out from data or to develop something that is latent but on its own isn't explicit. So it's kind of the perfect uh, fit in terms of vocabulary for what uh, our lab does, and I hope that as I go through the talk you'll see that. If you Google Educe Lab, one of the reasons why we wanted to make you know, a, a moniker or a, a marketing tool that would label the lab is because if you just Google Educe Lab, you will come up with our webpage where you will see some of our projects and a description of the work that we're doing right here at the University of Kentucky. So if you don't remember anything, including my name, remember Educe Lab, and you'll be able to find some of the information that I'm talking about today. Also, I want you to know that uh, Dr. Rafi Finkel has kept a complete archive of all of these uh, Keeping Current seminars over the years, and they're available on the webpage listed here. Uh, and I have had students of mine, and in the past I also have spoken in this venue, so you can find those talks in the archive. Um, and as I look out, I do see some of the Deuce Lab uh, team members here. Uh, Bruno, Sydney. Stephen, welcome back, Stephen, from, from surgery. Yes, glad you're here. Uh, we're going to make Frank an honorary member by the end, so we'll count him as well. So yeah, it's good to see you guys. Uh, I'm going to divide the talk into three sections, um, and I'll finish with um, what I hope will be most interesting to you as a computer scientist, which is some talk about AI, artificial intelligence, and how it's been influencing the work that we've been doing. But, First, I want to review some of our projects and the successes that we've had to set the context. And then I want to talk in the middle a little bit about the ecosystem of the equipment that we're building right here at the University of Kentucky and why I'm excited about that. And then we'll get to the uh, AI in our rousing conclusion. So um, I guess it's been seven years now uh, when our breakthrough result occurred. The scroll that you're seeing here on the left is uh, a, an artifact that was discovered in 1972 on the western shore of the Dead Sea near a place called En Gedi. This is a replica of, uh, a scale replica of that scroll. And I'll just pass it around so that you can see what that looks like. This scroll was so badly damaged that it was simply archived at Discovery because it wasn't able to be opened or, or read, but it was clear that it was a, an artifact that contained writing. Um, by the way, En Gedi is near the southern Judean Desert, uh, which is the site of the referred to in the Bible, uh, where David and Saul uh, were um, chasing each other, basically. Uh, so you see here in 1 Samuel 21.1, which is the Old, Old Testament, we have Saul and David uh, running around the desert of En Gedi. So uh, a very uh, old place, a place uh, noted in ancient documents. Um, but in particular, this scroll, which was discovered and, and archived, came out of the archives at a moment when uh, our work was progressing here. 
And you see here a, a scan being made of the scroll using uh, X-ray computed tomography, which I'll talk more about later. That scan was actually given to me. Uh, the data from that scan was given to me by the director of the Israel Antiquities Authority. Uh, pictured here with one of my staff members, Seth Parker. And Penina Shore uh, gave me that data because she believed that our scientific approach to being able to look inside that data and find structure and even writing uh, might have a way of them actually working. And it turns out that it did. We were able to convert the microcomputed tomographic scan into a, an, an, the image that you see here, which I'll talk more about later. Uh, but it, in, in uh, technical terms, it uh, was the fruition of a lot of work on our part to make that happen. But in uh, biblical scholarship, it was also uh, the, the basis for a publication that appeared uh, that edited the written transcript, which was a first worldwide that um, anyone was ever able to write a biblically based, a biblical scholarship paper on a scroll that had never been opened. Okay? So the first experiments for being able to do that happened right here at the University of Kentucky in the early 2000s, the early aughts, where we used medical equipment to get micro, to get computed tomography not at the micro scale, but at a scale that was good enough for us to be able to get results. I'll return to this in a minute, but I want to point out that one of our own was the one who actually did that scan back in the early aughts. So, uh, Professor Merrick, do you recognize this young man? He does recognize Cody Bumgardner, who was Victor's PhD student and ultimately matriculated and graduated here with PhD and is now on faculty over in the College of Medicine. So that first experiment convinced us back in the early aughts that we would be able to use scanning technology to see the structure and the writing of something without opening it, and that we would be able to use software tools to elicit or deduce information that's latent inside that object, right, without having to physically disturb the object. And what happened from those early experiments is we developed um, a pipeline of software stages. And I call it here the virtual unwrapping pipeline. Uh, that we, we think actually is, is pretty general and can apply to the, this general approach uh, in a lot of different heritage contexts. So you see me uh, labeling here the steps of this pipeline. We have Acquisition, which is the step where you actually acquire the scan data of the object. After that first step, it's all data science, right? You don't need to disturb the physical object at all after the first step because segmentation, texturing, flattening, and merging, uh, which I'll show you an example of later where we actually run a video, all of those things happen on the software side. So believe it or not, heritage science then in this context becomes a data science problem. Uh, not just a material science or a chemistry problem. Material science would be, hey, I want to find a physical way to actually open this up. So can I treat it with something and make it relax because I know that it's animal skin? Um, chemistry would be, you know, maybe I can find a, a way to chemically treat this thing so I can stabilize it and do something with it. Data science allows us to do these things without any of that physical intervention. So here's a, a little bit of the retrospective uh, as I sort of include the intro uh, to show you that microcomputed tomography and tomography itself is relatively new on the stage. The first application of computed tomography to anything in heritage science happened in the late 70s, about the time that the Nobel Prize for Computed Tomography was awarded, um, which was 1979. The Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to two people for developing computed tomography. And almost immediately, of course, it was being applied to mummies because they, they're human bodies, and that's what microcomputed tomography was for. CT was for human bodies, and um, it was a very natural first step. All that was happening before the internet occurred, which is the mid-90s, and late in that decade, virtual flattening, and then the virtual unwrapping experiment that you just saw 
occurred. And it wasn't until later in that decade that we did uh, the first experiments on real material. Peter Perry Claude et Cat, and I'm going to talk more about what that material is in a minute. And then it wasn't until 2015 that we actually broke through on the Angetti School. So you can see that I was an instant overnight success after three decades of work to be able to get to the point where Engetti occurred and we are now standing on the, um, the backside of that. So let me talk about some projects that led up to that work to give you a little bit more context uh, for the ecosystem that I'm interested in building here at the University of Kentucky. The Venetus A. The Venetus A is a manuscript that is stored in the Marciano Library in Venice, Italy. The library is right on the Plaza San Marco which is the place that you see in all the pictures where the Doge uh, retreat is, is located, where all the pigeons are, and which floods now because of the sea level rise. Okay, the library is right there. Um, after years of planning in conjunction with Harvard University and their, the Center for Hellenic Studies, which is associated with Harvard, um, we, we organized a team of more than 10 people and took all the gear that we needed on site and we imaged the Venetus A. The Venetus A is a manuscript that is the oldest complete copy of Homer's Iliad. Um, there are fragmentary copies from earlier because, as you know, the Iliad is a manuscript, is a story from antiquity. Antiquity would be before the first century. Um, the Iliad is actually, the, this uh, manuscript, the Venetus A, is actually 10th century, so you're talking about a thousand years past when the earliest witness, but it's the oldest complete copy because the medieval um, scribes often were in the business of trying to preserve the things from antiquity, and so they made copies, and then they put those copies in libraries, and some of those we still got. So here you see the cradle that we used to hold the manuscript while we did the imaging, and here you see uh, us setting that up on site and kibitzing around where things needed to be set the cradle is actually tipped because the, the camera needed to be orthogonal to the pages, but we couldn't lay the book flat because it would stress the binding. So we laid the book in a cradle, the manuscript in a cradle that allowed um, only like a 90 degree angle, right? But then um, allowed the camera to still shoot that in an ortho orthonormal way. And uh, that's why it's tipped the way it is. And what was interesting about this project is that we, at the same time we were doing the photography, we also acquired shape information of every page. Because it turns out that the pages are not flat, they're wrinkled because they're made out of animal skin. And that wrinkling causes distortion when you do photography, which assumes that all the pages are just flat. You have something that's rolling in and out of focus, you have uh, distortion that comes from the fact that the text is higher here and lower there. Uh, the idea was that if we captured shape with this pharaoh arm, we would be able to use the shape to do a digital restoration of the fact that we were photographing something that was not flat. So if you want to see more about this project, uh, you can check out a feature-length film that we made called uh, Imaging the Iliad, a Digital Renaissance. Um, it was posted to YouTube in its entirety on May 16th. 2012, and uh, it did get some some good comments. You can read these. A year ago, uh, when I saw this, I cried. What a remarkable and important project, a part of a lineage, thanks to all of you involved. Here's one from uh, David. Fantastic story. Thanks for posting, and thanks for posting the link. Sadly, it was Greek to me, but that's a joke. The manuscript is, in fact, written in Greek. <coughs> but I like this one the best, from the Lord of Confusion. Amazing, thank you for this excellent upload. I learned a lot. Take a look at the movie, I think you'll enjoy it. It shows everything about what you'd like to see and what we wanted to achieve. But the thing I want to leave you with here as we move on in the talk is that the digital shape estimation that we made of every page allowed us to do flattening. We could flatten every page, and that flattening feeds into unwrapping because it's just a dimensional step forward to say, instead of just pushing something flat, I'm actually gonna fully unwrap it. So it, in a lot of ways, it was a precursor to the full digital unwrapping that we've done with the Angetti Scroll. So let me talk about the Herculaneum Scrolls. Um, 
Another set of scrolls that are iconic are the scrolls from Herculaneum, which was a city that was near Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius exploded in AD 79. Uh, the material has been uh, recovered from an archaeological dig 250 years ago, and most of it is stored in the library in Naples. Uh, but some of it is actually distributed across three other organizations, the Institut de France, which is in Paris, uh, the uh, British Library in London, and the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And the reason why some of the material that was discovered at Herculaneum uh, was disseminated is because they were used uh, as artifacts of great, great value. And so dignitaries, kings, queens who had access to the material would barter with it or trade it or gift it. Um, and it. And it meant so much because it was a library from antiquity. It's the only one ever discovered in place. We have records of libraries from antiquity being destroyed, like the fire at Alexandria. But this is the only library that was ever discovered that was in place. There were more than 1,200 scrolls, maybe 1,400, discovered in the archaeological dig. And as they were opened up to various degrees of stress and damage, it was discovered that indeed they were philosophical works written in Latin and in Greek on all of the things that we think about as humans, on death on poetry, on piety, uh, on providence. Um, there are many titles, and many have been opened to a fragmentary witness. And because the witness is frag fragmentary, these titles are actually made up titles. They're titles that are given based on the vocabulary that the scholars glean, saying, I, th I think this is about prayer. I think this is about poetry. So we're going to call this work on prayer, on poetry, uh, even though it's fragmentary and I can only read half the words. Right? But there are hundreds of these scrolls that are still unopened, and it became an intriguing pursuit of mine to see if there would be a way, like that first experiment, right here at the University of Kentucky, where we could use technology to see inside these scrolls and to elicit, to deduce the manuscript that is inside, the text that is inside, without having to physically open so our first effort at doing this was in the late aughts. This slide from 2009 shows the team at the time uh, on site at the Institut de France, where we set up equipment to make a mobile lab uh, for three weeks in the, uh, the Institut de France's first floor. And we used a box truck to bring a microcomputer tomography machine from Belgium uh, to install and run to make scans of the scrolls in that environment. You can see us setting up material there, and you can see me presenting works, uh, work to the librarian on the left, Madame Castro, and the, uh, actually the head of the French Academy, um, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, and his wife. Um, so I'm going to show you some results from this work in a bit. Uh, there are also Herculean scrolls at Oxford, and I want to relay an interesting story to you by way of, um, by way of maybe how you look at your own work. Uh, there are three intact scrolls at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. I don't know, have any of you ever been to Oxford, to the university? Stephen, you have. Uh, Judy, you have. Victor, of course. Um, so the Bodleian is, is the central library right across the street from the special collections. is the building called the Camera which is a beautifully architected building. It's not far from Christchurch College, which is where, they, um, where Lewis Carroll actually was dean. Uh, so a story to place, and it turns out that they ended up with um, some Herculaneum material, which originally was in the House of Windsor because they had been given to the royal family, and then it made its way into the Bodleian Library. So we started a project to be able to work with that material. We were told that we were not able to access the intact scrolls. Um, but in a show of good faith, we worked with the open material. And here you see one of the trays of that open material. Um, can you see the sections uh, in, in this shot? Uh, the papyrus that gets opened from these scrolls from Herculaneum 
peel off like an onion and then they, they break. Sometimes they even cut the scroll on the lengthwise side so that they could peel the top and the bottom and then paste them down on the board. That's the best physical intervention that anyone has ever found. So the open ones, uh, we went ahead and, and imaged. And those results have turned out to be really, really good and interesting, and we're completing them now. But the idea of working on that was so that we could actually look at the intact scrolls which for three years I was told would be unthinkable. Unthinkable, that was the uh, word that the conservator used for uh, my idea that we might look at the scrolls. It was unthinkable, but the problem is, see, I hadn't thought of it. So I knew that it was not unthinkable. Right? It just took a little bit of time to be able to get to the place, and now I know how much time it took. It took three years. And then guess what? I was allowed to look at them, not touch them, not work on them, but we were allowed to look at them. This is what it looks like for me to look at three intact Herculean scrolls at Oxford. Okay, well, why do I, why do I bring this up? We weren't able to work on these. We haven't been able to yet. Well, the reason why is just like your work. You know, sometimes you get a barrier in the way, right? And it seems like you're not going to make progress. Um, but there are a few things that impede your progress that can change over time. Um, and the people involved can change, the problems can change, the technologies can change. And then the barriers change. So what you have to remember is that you've got to be tenacious in your work. Okay? My, my tenacity argument goes back all the way to Naples. The reason why we're looking at scrolls in Oxford in that picture is because I asked in 2006 to be able to work on the scrolls and the material in Naples. And this is the letter that I got back when I made that request. It's in Italian. I don't know how many of you can read Italian, some of you. But I can translate this. It says not just no, but it says hell no. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's what it said. It's in Italian, so it's nicer. But guess what? Today we're working in Italy in the library with a full team on the ground. And this is me with the new director. Um, all smiles wide because we have funding, we have access, and we're working on that material that in 2006 I got a letter that said I was never going to work on that material. Okay? So if you wait long enough, and I'll come back to my team on site at the very end, um, if you wait long enough, you basically get to be able to use the bathroom that has the best view in all of Naples. And that's this bathroom right here. Because if you look out the window of this bathroom, this is what you see. In the background, you see um, Mount Vesuvius having exploded its top 2,000 years ago. It looks like a big cone now. And in the, the near field, you see uh, a castle and then the um, cruise ship area that comes in and out of the bay of Naples. So it's, it's a beautiful area. And the library contains almost all, except those three scrolls in Oxford, right? And it contains almost all of the carbonized papyrus and the literature from Herculaneum. This is what the room looks like where uh, the archive is actually stored. You have rows and rows of these file cabinets with all of the um, trays that contain the things that they tried to open stored. And, and this is what it looks like. The cornice are the trays of flattened papyrus. And you can see the way they've either been cut or they broke as they tried to do wrap after wrap after wrap and then paste them down. On the left, corniche. On the right, scorza. Anybody knows what the, know what the uh, Italian word scorza means? Stephen? It means bark. Bark. Because when they started this work, the outer part of the scroll was so badly carbonized from the eruption that um, they just peeled it off and tossed it because they figured out nothing we can do. And they tossed it into these drawers called the scorts drawers. So we have we have corniche, which are the opened fragments that reveal some writing. We have the scorza, which is the bark, which you know may or may not have writing. And then we have the intact scrolls. Here you see two, four, six, eight of them with Seth in the background taking a look. Uh, there are actually 600. 
are actually 600. There, there are 100 drawers that store um, fragments that are completely intact, that represent manuscripts that have never been read. I want you to think, and if you remind me, I'll return to it at the end. If, if that manuscript could contain something that would appeal to you, what would it be? What would it be? 600 unique manuscripts from antiquity, guaranteed authentic. Nobody's read them. There they are, right there. Okay, so you see some of the passion I've developed, right? It's right there. When they opened the scrolls, oftentimes words were available and they were readable. So they would write a sketch. The Italian word descendio means sketch uh, of what they saw. And then and often they would scrape the layer away, gone forever, see the layer underneath, and write another sketch. So you see the fragmentary nature of the collection and the material challenges. The Corniche, there are 3,500 trays. This is a lot of material. Those trays represent things that are stuck together. They're, um, they're multiple layers. They didn't separate all the layers. They're incredibly fragile. And when you look at them with the naked eye, it's really hard to even see that there is writing, even though there is writing, because it's black on black. It's really hard to segment where the ink is. The squirts are even worse. There are 100 trays. There are, they're in chunks. They didn't even bother to try to open them up, and we don't know if there's writing that's visible or not. The Desenyi and all of the sketches that represent the Desenyi collection um, captured things that are now gone. And often it's not clear where they should be positioned in a manuscript that was rolled up and then cut and then laid flat. You see the geometry of the puzzle, right? And then we have finally the intact scrolls which uh, is, you know, I have to admit, one of the most intriguing things for me because we have hundreds, the interior text is almost completely unknown, and some are completely, I mean, like completely, totally intact. So our mission in this project is to use our technology to address the uh, Herculaneum collection in all its forms, all its forms. And I'm gonna show you uh, some current workflow or how we are addressing uh, some of this, and then I'm gonna conclude in the AI section in how we're addressing the question of reading the ones that are completely intact without opening them. So right now I have a team in Naples. I, I got back from the library Saturday night, and we are in production now, which means every day we're doing 32 trays of Corniche, and we have 3,500, so you can do the math of how long that's, that's gonna take. Um, we have a workflow set up so that we can do this reliably to uh, assign a unique name for cataloging, take multispectral photographs, uh, photogrammetry, um, which is 3D sh shape imaging, and then uh, check everything so that at the end of the day we have secure and good data. This is our, this is our team in Italy, uh, with the exception of Seth on the far right, who is uh, my lead tech on this project. Um, he and I have been going back and forth. Uh, let me show you. Um, oh, yeah. Let me show you the uh, results from the photogrammetry system. So normally, a tray like this would be observed by a scholar using a microscope, and they take the tray and they look through the microscope to see if they can see anything. Um, probably with natural lighting, nothing special, and then they might be using a reference photograph on a to help them locate uh, the writing. What we're trying to do is improve that process by using a system that we custom built to be able to create a representation of every one of those open trays that's three-dimensional. Using photogrammetry, we have a system based on five cameras, one central and then four cameras that are pointed at an angle. And this system sweeps over the tray and collects images. And then we use photogrammetry to reconstruct the three dimensions. Uh, of every tray. You can see these pictures from the lab. That's not an actual tray. Uh, that's one that um, Stephen made in his fire pit, right? Yeah, campfire. Good campfire, yeah. Um, and this is uh, what it looks like. So we have two directions of motion, x, y, sweep across the entire tray, calculate all the images, and then we take all of those images it takes about six minutes for a scan, so we generate a thousand images or more. 
and then we run a plot-based uh, photogrammetry reconstruction over them for a few hours, and then we get the result. Um, and the result looks like this. Okay, this is the three-dimensional result that comes from photogrammetry. Um, on top of that, we have a spectral system. And this spectral system creates images under different lighting conditions. Because it turns out that if you, ins if you illuminate these very, very difficult to read manuscripts with different kinds of light, and by that I mean from ultraviolet to infrared, you're able to create an image that gives you much more contrast. So we have a spectral imaging system that looks like this. And the lights toggle at different spectrums, and then the image, which is a grayscale uh, digital back, collects a response for each of those incident energies. And I'm showing you from ultraviolet all the way to infrared that a fragment like the one you're seeing reveals its ink as you get to the infrared spectrum. So can you see how at the infrared you can actually see the writing in that column? Okay, so we're doing both of those things on all 3,500 trays right now um, in, the, uh, in the library at, uh, in Naples. All right, I'm going to finish this uh, projects section by remarking on some work that we did at the Getty because this is going to drive home the reason why I want to build an ecosystem here at the University of Kentucky. Um, after a year of planning and some borrowed laboratory equipment, we spent a week on site bunch of people to try to capture more data from intact Herculean scrolls while they were on loan to the Getty from Italy. We jumped in the middle and said, look, if you're transporting the scrolls off-site, which was really unusual, it doesn't usually happen, we'd like to do some experiments with them if we could work it out. We worked it all out. The experiments had to be done in a borrowed lab at UCLA. Uh, we collected some data, and this was a uh, look at what that data collection looked like. It's a Cali lab, and it turned out to be in the College of Dentistry uh, at UCLA. We're grateful that um, those folks let us use their equipment. Um, but it was tight. It was tight. And we had media and these Italian uh, conservators, and you see people fascinated with what we were trying to do. And these fragments were on the way to the Getty for uh, so through no small amount of wrangling, we were able to actually do some experiments. Um, but this is what the press, this is what the press wrote after we used uh, this lab to collect the data. Reclaim scrolls to be sent to the dentist for virtual unwrapping. <laughs> exactly. You don't read anything about the University of Kentucky or my talented team or anything, right? So it turns out that the dentist at UCLA and the Getty got all the press or the work we were trying to do. And what I realized is, if percolating material is going to travel, and can travel, we need to build a lab here at the University of Kentucky where that material and other kinds of material can come right here and we can do the work. It's too hard to set up movable labs in places that um, create lots of obstacles for that to happen. It's unreliable and difficult. And so why not build a Gold Star Lab here? And that is exactly what we're doing. So I want to talk for a minute about the ecosystem that's happening and then we'll finish with AI. The ecosystem, driven by these successful projects and our desire to see uh, material coming here, students here being able to work on that material, um, is um, being developed through a mid-scale infrastructure grant from the National Science Foundation. When we wrote this grant, we argued that constellations of equipment are worthy to be considered mid-scale infrastructure. NSF has a definition of what small, mid, and large-scale infrastructure is. You can think about large-scale infrastructure as being sort of McMurdo, you know, a base in Antarctica, $200 million, okay? Or a telescope in Argentina, $150 million. Um, Small-scale equipment, you can think of being things that you and I buy for the lab, cameras, and flatbed scanners, and, and things like that. But we made the argument that mid-scale is missing and also really expensive. And in particular, micro-CT, which has been my thing. Each one of the micro-CT systems that we've looked at that we use is between 
500,000 and 1.5 million, a single system. And they're not portable. So it's not like you can schlep those things around and easily set them up to make them work. So Induced Lab represents infrastructure for heritage science, constructed right here at the University of Kentucky, in operational clusters that I've outlined here with um, the, the key players, uh, the, the COIs, and there are more people involved than I've shown on this slide, but the uh, COIs shown here. Um, and I just want to point out the operational divisions of the infrastructure that we're building to do this science. Bench are the uh, immobile, sensitive, high dollar instruments that sit in a bench lab setting. Microcomputed tomography, uh, scanning XRF, uh, round spectroscopy, um, other kinds of material composition methods, uh, scanning electron microscopy. Flex represents a design system that is configurable so that we can address objects that are unpredictable and difficult to deal with. Like somebody finds a 17th century globe. It's huge, but it's awesome because it's interesting. And some of the surface is, is faded and we don't know what's inside. Okay, how do you deal with that? There isn't a machine you can just put that into. Flex is a place where we can deal flexibly with unpredictable uh, objects. And then mobile, the mobile operational unit will have two vans that will be equipped with onboard equipment that can be field deployed. And some of the onboard equipment, ground penetrating radar, drones with sensors, a trailer that has a mobile micro CT unit. You can imagine driving this to your hometown where there's a small museum that doesn't have enough money to move all of their objects around. But we can go there and work for a weekend and image and analyze the most interesting things in that collection and do a project. We're pretty excited about this uh, operational clustering because it gives us a lot of opportunity. And at the core is the last operational cluster, which I call cyber. And that's why I'm ending this talk with AI. Because the thing that's transforming much of heritage science right now is the fact that AI has taken off and has allowed us solutions to problems that we didn't think we would be able to solve even a decade ago. So at the heart of the infrastructure we're building here is cyber, which is basically a lot of machinery to do storage and also to do um, the, the standard artificial intelligence operations that you've come to know, like uh, training a convolutional neural network. Um, and finding the cycles to be able to do that. Um, to give you just some schematics for uh, what this looks like, the flex environment will look something like this. Movable x-ray source, movable sensor, the ability to position odd-sized and weird objects in front of the x-ray to do either radiography or full-on tomography. Um, here's a schematic for mobile, where you see the vans with trailers field deployed so that they can look at a large, perhaps archaeological area, or a suspected grave site, or, uh, or some kind of area that we suspect is a chemical uh, or environmental problem, uh, where we have sensors where we can sense chemistry as we scan. Um, and then finally, cyber. Well, here's bench. So you see the kinds of machines we have, optical microscopy, um, scanning electron microscopy, micro CT, and, and so forth. And then cyber, where you have the standard huge data store, ability to do um, large scale memory things in a distributed context, access to uh, high speed network. All right, so now we're to AI. And the 40 minutes, but I want to end early enough so that we can banter around just a few questions before we, uh, I guess we're gonna get pizza, right? So. Um, here's the dream. The dream is that Herculaneum, physically unwrapped on the left, can actually be solved through virtual unwrapping on the right. First experiment showed that this was possible in a laboratory environment, with very little uh, extra tools. But when we went and scanned the first Herculaneum scroll in 2009 in France, remember the box truck, right, that brought this equipment? Well, there's the conservator, Fabienne Kerou, putting our scroll into that machine that was inside that box truck. And we see the first radiograph of the top end of a scroll. And I'm going to pass around a couple of scrolls so that you can see 
what we've had to engineer to be able to scan them. These are replicas of real scrolls. And if you open this up, you'll see there's a form fit case that holds the scroll so that it can sit like this and pirouette safely inside the machine. Pass that around. Well, the problem is that um, this is the reality, right? So please, virtually unwrap this for me. One of you, anyone, if I don't care. Yeah. So our pipeline from acquisition to segmentation all the way through to merging uh, doesn't allow, initially, for solving some of these difficult problems that we encountered when we finally collected the data of a real We had technical milestones along the way. I mean, getting the scan in 2009 was really, really great, but we weren't able to progress. We wrote a paper in 2013 that got a lot of attention, and it led to the uh, Getty scroll, which you'll see in a minute was somewhat easier of a technical problem, which led to more access and the ability to do more data. Um, we've also solved some of our funding problems because the green represents continued funding for working on heritage science problems across the spectrum. And we also have solved our access problem because you can see back in the day, see the bottom line Naples all red? Well, it finally turned green in the late 2018-19 area. And now we have access to three out of the four institutions. So here are all of those barriers, and look at how it all lines up green for the past three years. Isn't that amazing? Except uh, there was COVID, and it wiped out all the green, right? Well, not quite. It didn't quite wipe out all the green. Um, in this far right column, I'm going to show you the progress that we've made in Herculaneum. But first, I, I promised I would return to uh, Ed Getty and show you a little bit more detail about this scroll, because it was our breakthrough work. This is the site of the archaeological discovery. It is now a national park in Israel. And the uh, tent that covers the, uh, the archaeological site protects this mosaic floor, which turned out to be a Byzantine uh, synagogue, Jewish synagogue. And at the edge of the synagogue's floor, mark number eight here, was discovered the, the holy ark of the synagogue which is the place where uh, sacred material was stored. And at excavation time, I got this picture from the archaeologist, uh, Sethi Perel, um, who was in his mid to late 30s at the time of the discovery. You can see that this is what that holy ark looked like. Um, he pulled with his own hands uh, that scroll from the ground, and it stayed in the archive for almost 50 years until we received the data and the data only, I had never seen the scroll, from the director of the Israel Antiquity Authority uh, Dead Sea Scroll Project. This is what one of those cross-sectional slices from the data looked like. You can see the animal skin bubbled up. And the colored sections are our algorithm running to do the segmentation as part of virtual unwrapping. OK, now I'm going to show you the video that shows the I'll narrate this. Um, you see a simulation on the left of uh, the scroll body from above. And in the center, you see what the slices look like. But as a volume, you can view the structure that comes from microcomputed topography. And this was pretty high resolution, about 18 microns. Um, that structure is in the data set. And I've rendered it there for you so that you can see that not just the external layers, but also every internal wrap is available in some way and captured in that scheme. So in terms of segmentation, the tools that we've built allow us to isolate each one of those wraps separately and then model it as a surface. Once we can model it as a surface, we can texture that surface from the original volume based on where in that volume it sits. And we get on the right the actual internal layer with the texture that was captured with the scan. And you can clearly see there's systematic writing 
captured in the scan because the ink has some kind of metal in it and it shows up really well in the scan. And then the final part is to take that potato chip and flatten it so that for each of the sections that we identify, model, texture, and then flatten, we can merge together into one unified composite that represents every wrap that we have available inside that scroll. That merge gives us this image. And on the top, do you see the divots? That's because part of the scroll was missing. And as every time you unroll it, that missing part grows a little bit. And so you have these regular divots, wrap after wrap. You can basically count the wraps looking at those divots. Uh, the Hebrew writing represents, uh, the actually is the um, Masoretic text of Leviticus chapter one and chapter two. Uh, and is, um, it represents one of the earliest copies of Leviticus that we have. Okay. So that image was used as the basis for this article that appeared um, at the Hebrew University Bible Project, um, edited by Michael Siegel, who's the chairman of the uh, Biblical Studies program at the University and co-authored by Emmanuel Tov, who is emeritus now, but he is the foremost leading scholar on Dead Sea Scroll material. They wrote that paper with this image alone, which came from virtual unwrapping. And they had no other information than that. And they were able to get a, a, a complete transcript and publish that paper. Um, and I'd just like to note that it appeared on the front page of the New York Times. Um, that photo, that picture. Okay, so the challenge for Herculaneum, um, because it's a scroll, and we did that with Getty, so what's the problem, right? Uh, well, the challenge is that the, the dream of a few wraps is not the reality for Herculaneum. Um, in fact, William Wordsworth wrote about Herculaneum when he wrote the poem September 1819. He wrote, O ye who patiently explore the wreck of Herculaneum lore, what rapture could ye seize some Theban fragment or unroll one precious tender-hearted scroll of pure Simonides? The wreck of Herculaneum lore is what jumps out at me because it is an absolute wreck. And for, our, for all our analysis, for a long time we didn't have the tools that we needed to be able to solve this problem. In fact, even now, if you Google my name with the adjective Stymied, <laughs> you'll find a link to a, an article in 2010 that says we're stymied. And we haven't been able to read those scrolls. In fact, the conventional wisdom is that we're never going to be able to read the Herculean scrolls because the ink isn't right, the chemistry of it, and because we just got lucky with the Getty scroll. It was like the perfect case. After 20 years of work, we, we got lucky. And Carbon ink, you can't see in tomography. Okay, that was the conventional wisdom until the good team that's working with me now using AI helped us with the emerging work. So now I'm gonna finish by talking about that emerging work. Um, we found a path forward actually by discovering, first of all, something obvious. Carbon ink is not invisible in computed tomography. This is carbon ink. It's on an index card. You can see the shape of the carbon. So you can see that the carbon is there, and you can even tell that the index card is a little bit different of a composition than the carbon. So we developed a new understanding. There's going to be shape information that we're going to be able to see where the ink is, but we're probably going to need higher resolution to be able to see that shape information because it's tiny. And then once we feel like we've captured something that represents that ink, even if we can't see it with the naked eye, we have to find a way to amplify the signal. And machine learning or deep learning is exactly the thing we need. So actively pursuing the idea that the structure of the papyrus, when it gets ink on it, right, is detectable using tomography, using machine learning, and the correct resolution, is what led us to the active pursuit of taking these fragments to a national lab and collecting very, very high resolution data. I call this the carbon ink challenge. Our first ever experiment doing this shows a single letter form on a fragment that we scanned. Uh, and the fragment shows uh, this 
lunate sigma, which is a Greek letter sigma written in the old style, which is just looks like a C. And on the right, you see the tomography that doesn't show any visible ink. Really frustrating, because without the visible ink, everybody says, well, there's nothing there. But it turns out visibility is not the same thing as, uh, as absence, right? Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, here's, here's some insight with the actual scanning electron microscopy. So you see the bottom half of this blank papyrus has ink on it. And the bottom half has a clear texture uh, that represents that ink down here. And up above, we have texture that represents naked papyrus. Okay, here's what that looks, up, looks like in close-up. With high enough resolution, you can clearly tell with the cracks and the way the ink lays on top of the papyrus, you don't see the papyrus pattern anymore. There's a big difference at the microscopic level between the ink and the knot. But look, if I draw a circle and, and ask you to look in the center and tell me where the ink stops, you can do it there and you can kind of do it there, but when you have a low enough resolution, you can't tell anymore. So our scans from 2009 looked like this, at 25 micron voxel size, the microtomography gave us this. Our recent data gives us that. Which looks better to you, that or that? So actually, you have a shot at unwrapping this, right? You can sort of see where the layers are. These are beautiful, by the way. This data set is beautiful. Um, eight micron voxel size. That's an endon slice view, and this is a lengthwise view. Now, you see in this view why no one can physically unwrap this, right? You see how the material is crunched in both directions and resists <laughs> unrolling around some common Okay, so first breakthrough with deep learning, we learned how to make the evidence of carbon ink visible in micro CT. And we did it by basically doing a supervised learning using a convolutional neural network. We built a proxy that allowed us to say, okay, here is carbon ink, here is some different kinds of ink, here is papyrus alone. We're going to train up those label sets by aligning the CT scan of something with the position that we know everything sits in that scan and building a big lookup table, basically building a big label set that matches volumes at some sub quality with labels that represent ink or no ink or different kinds of ink. Okay, with enough examples, you can take a proxy like this. Oh, and by the way, the columns are labeled based on how thick the carbon ink is. So, uh, we have six layers of carbon ink in column six and only one in column one. The tomography doesn't really show anything to the naked eye, but when you apply in an unfold experiment the learning, you can see that we can make the carbon ink become visible. Okay, so on the first experiment with the lunate sigma, the photo and then the micro CT shows nothing, but when we do the unfold training, we can make the ink response appear with fairly few numbers of training data. Actually, it's n-fold, so we're dividing up, um, training on what we have, leaving one out, and then, uh, and then doing the uh, classification. Okay, so what does that look like, an n-fold on an actual fragment? Well, here's an actual fragment from Herculaneum. You can clearly see the writing on the left. And surprise, there's actually a hidden layer for which we don't know the answer. We know the answer for the top layer of what it should be, and we can tell if we're getting the ink to, to um, respond. Uh, here's how the machine learning is, is operating at the current time. And here's the hidden layer. And you can see under the hidden layer, we're getting exactly the predictable thing that we expect. A row there of text, a row there of text, and a row there of text, for which we have no ground truth because we don't know that's hidden. But the ink on the visible layer is appearing in exactly the correct spot in the center. I would say this is on the order of readability. And to prove that, I would say, here are the microcomputed tomography with no enhancement. Here's how far we get with machine learning. And here's how far we need to go. That's the label set. OK, last thing. 
you're looking at x-ray, it doesn't look as good as photography. The second place we're using AI is to actually make the result look photographically correct rather than look just like enhanced x-ray. So you can imagine creating a label set that's more robust than an ink no ink binary label, right? But instead, creating a convolutional neural network or some kind of supervised training that allows you to learn the relationship between the tomography and a photographically correct render. This is not a photograph. This is actually an Enfold experiment that shows that working on our proxy. In other words, the top row is the photograph, and then the tomography is the second row. The third row is the binary rendering of what the machine learning can do, but the fourth row is rendering a photographically correct or simulated result um, from the tomography alone. So imagine if we were able to go ahead and apply this to Herculaneum so that we could create a representation of these hidden layers that not only enhances the ink, which no one thought that we could ever do because it's carbon ink, right? But there it is, right? We've learned it. That's how far we have to go. And imagine that we can then create something that's photographically correct so that when we render the result, it looks more like a photograph of a, an undamaged fragment as opposed to a damaged one. So that's where we are. We're on the edge. That's my timer. We're on the edge of readability. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, amazing team of folks here in Kentucky, um, including Stephen, who's here, and, uh, and uh, Ms. Chapman, who's also here, uh, and Bruno, who's also here. Um, and you guys got to go with us to Italy last year, uh, earlier this year, right? Great trip, right? And presented some of the work you've done with me in that forum. And I'd also like to acknowledge again the Naples team, um, because without their help, uh, we wouldn't be doing anything while I'm standing here lecturing to you. And I want to ask if you have any questions. So thank you very much. We do have some time for questions, but maybe one for this very exciting talk. Where are you? It's only pizza, guys. It's only pizza. Guys. <laughs> You can also you know, talk to Dr. Brandon when we have questions again. Go ahead, Steve. What was the 3D scanning method used by DNR in the early years? Yeah, so that was a linked joint system from Ferro. And the way it worked is the, the tip was a laser based. Uh, striping system. It projected a um, structured light pattern, which was basically a stripe. And as you swept that stripe over, it would detect the stripe in the camera and then measure the, the position of all the links and joints um, in, in a big circle. It had a wingspan of like six feet. So we hauled that thing all the way to the Marciano Library and then scanned for three weeks with that thing, every page. Thank goodness for photographing. Yeah, the space is wide and there are some corners that get pretty es esoteric, but material conservators, like paper conservators, you work with their hands every day, they restore their old books. Um, you, know, you, would, you would have very little in common with that person in terms of computing technology, but they understand so much about the materiality of how objects behave. So there's an example. Also, chemists who understand um, you know, organic chemistry so they can tell you, you know, what's going to happen to a certain kind of ink and how it's going to affect, you know, a certain kind of substrate. Um, and then, of course, you have the uh, the language experts who can read ancient Greek. So it's quite a varied space, I have to say. Did you guys see the, did anybody take the, I'll finish with this. 
take them out of the case and mold them like this. They fit together. See that? We did not know that. We, we scanned these separately. They're in a separate part of, collect of the collection, but it turns out they were on the same shelf of the library. Next to each other. Right? So there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Paul. 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 And don't forget to, uh, to sign your, you know, your name on the sign sheets when you have people. Thank you very much. Thank you.